In this video, we're going to talk about the morphology or the shapes and sizes and structures that viruses have and the two general ways that we classify viruses. But first, I want to show you just how small viruses are. In this picture, you can see a red blood cell, a human red blood cell just like ours, and they're really, really large. This little guy here is an E. coli, and these little dots down at the bottom, those are viruses. So a virus is about 100 times smaller than a bacteria and tens of thousands of times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. In the blown up picture of E. coli you see here, we can start to make out some of the larger viruses, but the super teeny tiny ones still just kind of look like specks. Now this large yellow one right here is smallpox. This long skinny thing right here is tobacco mosaic virus. This was the first virus ever isolated. And this crazy looking thing is a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. Sometimes that just gets shortened to phage instead of bacteriophage. All three of those are pretty large viruses. Most viruses are much, much smaller. Like polio here is one of our smallest at 30 nanometers. A bacteriophage MS2 is about 24 nanometers. Bacterial ribosomes are 25 nanometers. So this bacteriophage MS2 is about the same size as a ribosome. Viruses can come in a variety of shapes, a variety of sizes, and I wanted to give you an idea of what some of these look like. Again, we have smallpox virus here. Its scientific name is variola virus. It's pretty big. It's sort of oval shape. And then we have the herpes viruses, which are also pretty big. And these are more round. They're not always this round, but we do tend to draw them more circular. Rabies looks like a bullet, and so does every virus in its same group. At the end of this top row is SARS, and you'll recall that the current coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is very closely related to this SARS, so it looks like this as well. And to point out some of our smaller ones, here is a papillomavirus like HPV, which you've probably all heard of. Here is a parvovirus. If you've ever had a dog that's been vaccinated for parvo, that's what causes parvo, a parvovirus. This huge honking thing right here is Ebola. Ebola is unusual in shape and size, but I want to point out something really interesting here. The size of the genome has nothing to do with the size of the virus. Ebola virus, even though it's so huge on this picture, its genome is only around 18 kilobases. Smallpox or variola virus, on the other hand, is about 200 kilobases. SARS is roughly 30. Adenovirus is about 45 kilobases. And tiny little parvovirus down here kind of lives up to its tiny size. It's only about 5,000 bases in its entire genome. Looking at this picture, you see all these different shapes, all these different sizes, but all viruses do have a few things in common. All viruses have some form of genetic material. This can be DNA or it can be RNA. No other life forms have an RNA genome. It can be double-stranded DNA or it can be single-stranded DNA. It can be double-stranded RNA or it can be single-stranded RNA. Within our single-stranded RNA, it can be positive sense, which means it looks like a messenger RNA once it gets into the cell, or it can be negative sense, which means it does not look like a messenger RNA. It looks like the coding sequence of DNA instead. Now, if different types of genetic material wasn't enough, within that genetic material, there can also be variations. Viral chromosomes can be linear, like ours, where they make a straight line. So linear, single-stranded DNA that I just drew. Or they can be circular. We could have a circular double-stranded DNA chromosome or a circular single-stranded DNA chromosome or any combination thereof. And the last point of diversity is that viral genetic material can also be continuous, meaning that there's only one piece of it, or it can be segmented, meaning that multiple pieces of genetic material make up the entire genome. The second thing that all viruses have is a capsid. And this is a protein shell or a coat that protects the genetic material. Like with genomes, these come in a variety of flavors, but there's really two main structures that we see in capsids. The first is what we call an icosahedral capsid. We can draw it very simply, kind of like a six ring carbon structure that you learned how to draw in organic chemistry but it has multiple facets to it. Something like that, so a 3D structure with multiple facets. 
and an icosahedral capsid, the nucleic acid, be it DNA or RNA, is found there on the inside, protected by that 3D structure. The second main type of capsid that we see is called a helical capsid. These are more composed of overlapping proteins that form a tube-like structure. And the viral nucleic acid is kind of threaded through that hollow tube. If we draw a cross-section through that tube, looking at the inside, the viral genome is there threaded through the middle, bound to that capsid in order to protect it. The final type of capsid is called a complex capsid. It's called complex because it doesn't follow the same rules of symmetry. The icosahedral and the helical capsids are very symmetrical along a variety of axes. The complex capsids don't follow that same symmetry and they are neither icosahedral nor helical. So all viruses have some sort of genetic material and some sort of capsid to protect that genetic material. Some viruses, not all, but some viruses have an additional structure, and that's called the envelope. In viruses, the envelope is simply a lipid bilayer derived from either the cell cytoplasmic membrane or the cell's endoplasmic reticulum. In very rare instances, can be derived from the cell's nuclear membrane. Viruses get their envelopes when they are leaving the host cell in order to go out and find new cells to infect. Now, envelopes can be associated with the viral capsid in a couple of different ways. The first is that it can be closely associated. Think of this as being a tight fit. If we had a helical capsid like this that had an envelope, that envelope would fit right on the outside of the capsid and be right up next to it. This is what we see with viruses like Ebola and Marburg uh, and other viruses in that particular family. The other is that they can be loosely associated. And I think of this more like a bag around the viral capsid. An example of this is the herpes viruses, which have icosahedral capsids, but their envelope doesn't always fit so tight. It can be kind of loose on one end, and the virus capsid can kind of move around inside that envelope. All right, icosahedral capsids are made up of a bunch of different facets. And each of those individual facets is made up of a bunch of capsomeres. The capsomeres are represented by these individual kind of circles that you can see here, making up the triangular facet. Those capsomeres are made up themselves of between one to three different viral proteins. Icosahedral capsids are very stiff and inflexible, as you can imagine, because of their three-dimensional multiplanar shape. And here inside the three-dimensional structure is the viral nucleic acid, DNA, RNA, whatever it happens to have. They make for very nice pictures. You can see a whole bunch of individual icosahedral virions in this picture, and they stack up nice and rigid and look kind of like a honeycomb. Helical capsids, again, are a long hollow tube. They are still made up of capsomeres, although they don't have those rigid facets like we see on an icosahedral capsid. Instead, their capsomeres come together to form that tube, sort of stacking on one another. And as they stack, they form a sort of spiral, which can better be seen in the bottom picture here, where they tend to spiral like so. And these pictures show better than I can that the genetic material is threaded throughout Whereas icosahedral capsids are always very rigid and very stiff, helical capsids can still be rigid, as is the case for tobacco mosaic virus up top. It is very, very rigid. It makes these very straight, inflexible tubes, or they can be flexible. This bottom image is showing us Marburg virus. It can be found straight like this, or it can be found in circles. This one you can actually see is bent over on itself. So these are flexible. I wanted to give you guys a better picture of a viral envelope than what I can draw. This shows one that is loosely associated. So the envelope is in the kind of orangey color. It has a variety of spike proteins coming out of it. Those would be used to attach to a cell. And on the inside, there is a helical capsid with the nucleic acid on the inside. In this case, because the viral envelope is loosely associated, these viruses actually look pleomorphic when we look at them under an electron microscope. 
Okay, so different shapes, different structures, different sizes of viruses. How do we classify viruses? There's two different ways that viruses get classified. One is based on their properties or their characteristics. This is the ICTV method, which stands for the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. And the second is based on mRNA synthesis, or how does that particular viral genome, say a negative stranded RNA genome, make a messenger RNA. This was developed by a man named David Baltimore, so it's called the Baltimore system. Both ways of characterizing viruses have their merits. ICTV is good because it allows us to look at a virus structurally and figure out what it's closely related to. Dividing them up in the Baltimore system has its merits because it helps us remember as students and as researchers how this virus is going to replicate. Using the ICTV method, the first thing we look at is what is the genome made of. So for our RNA viruses, that's our first level of delineation. Then we go on to what type of capsid do they have, helical or icosahedral. From there, are they naked, which is non-enveloped, or do they have an envelope? And then the final thing we look at is their genome architecture. For instance, here, looking at this one, we have an RNA virus with an icosahedral capsid and no envelope that has a positive sense single-stranded RNA genome that is made up of one single nucleic acid. This belongs to the picornavirus family. Examples include rhinoviruses, which cause the common cold, and enteroviruses, which cause gastrointestinal distress. Now let's look at this one. We have an RNA virus with a helical capsid that is enveloped and has a negative sense single-stranded RNA genome that is composed of eight different segments. This belongs to the family Orthomyxoviridae, and the prime example of this one is one you've all heard of, influenza. These same two classification systems, ICTV and Baltimore, can also be applied to DNA viruses. DNA genome, icosahedral capsid, helical capsid, or a complex capsid. Are they naked or are they enveloped? A few of these have some weird parts where they're enveloped in one part of the cell and not in other parts of the cells. Don't worry about that for now. The next step, what does that genome look like? Now that we're looking at DNA, we not only take into account double-stranded, single-stranded, but is it linear or is it circular? Let's look at a few examples. This one right here, DNA virus, icosahedral capsid that is enveloped with a double-stranded linear DNA genome. This is our herpes virus family. Another example, double-stranded DNA, like herpes viruses, only this one is circular instead of linear. These also have an icosahedral capsid, like herpes viruses, only they are naked, they lack an envelope. This is the Papova virus family, the papillomaviruses, like human papillomaviruses and other viruses that cause warts. Okay, quick recap time. All viruses have a capsid. That can be icosahedral, that can be helical, or complex, which can have a variety of shapes. All viruses have some sort of genetic material, DNA or RNA genome. Those can be double-stranded, single-stranded, positive sense or negative sense, and they can be circular or linear. Now, some viruses have an envelope, and some viruses don't have an envelope, and we call those that don't have an envelope naked. And there are two distinct classification methods for viruses, the ICTV method, which classifies them based on characteristics, and the Baltimore classification, which classifies viruses based on how they synthesize their messenger RNA.